Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome. Uh, welcome to this fifth Sunday of Pentecost. Uh, welcome to our followers on Facebook and YouTube. I, uh, I spoke to a couple of them this week. We have some faithful followers. And uh, of course, welcome everybody here. Anybody, any place that's visiting with us, we are happy to have you. You honor us with our presence. Jim, good to see you. It's been a while. Good to see you. Good. Austin, always. Thank you. <clears throat> Many of you know, <clears throat> we had a memorial service here for our sister in Christ, Wendy Casper, yesterday. And um, man, what an overwhelming experience it was in so many ways. Um, one of the ways, and I'm gonna mention it in a, in a minute or two, was just the way that everybody in this church came together to make the whole thing happen. Uh, None of us, certainly me, is not aware of everything that Wendy did outside of this church. But as, the, as her family was doing their eulogies, it became obvious. And we had this church packed. There was not an empty seat in the pews. There were 25 chairs in the back, plus the dining room in the CE building was packed. Rick had set up a projector over there so that the service would be simulcast. And the visitation was scheduled for 10.30 to 11.30. Quarter after 10, people started filing in there. And I'm going to tell you, until for a good half hour, no 45 minutes, there were people lined up waiting to get in here. And the place kept filling up and filling up. And uh, by <coughs> quarter to 11, they were coming up and of course, Don was up here greeting them, and then they were just walking right out that door and going over to, to the CE building. There were over 50 people over there. So, uh, and at one point, I heard somebody ask Don if he knew all these people, and Don, Don essentially said he knew most of them, but there were dozens and dozens of people he didn't know because he didn't know, it's not that he, he obviously he was aware of what Wendy did, but he never met all the people that she interacted with. So. Man, it was, it, was, uh, it was moving to see all of the people that were here to honor Wendy. And what I really want to say is our church really did it well. You know, I, don't, I, I probably saw two dozen people walk up to Don and say, you know, sorry, Don, anything I can do. You know, they, and you got to say that. I know that. I've said it. I've had it said to me. But when you get down to it, there's very little that you can do. Food. You know, you can have food, bring, bring food. And I'll guarantee you by now, Don's got, he's got everything in a freezer refrigerator filled with food that people just automatically bring over. But the one thing that we did, and Don came up to me after the the whole process was over, and he said, he said it to me because he was talking to me, Jack, thank you so much, and it wasn't me, there was, you know, half a dozen people that worked to, to put this whole thing together, but he said, thanks, he said, I can't thank you enough, and that's when it struck me that we in this church, and it's not just the people that were here, because, you know, not everybody could, could make it. But this church family came together, did what we do, and we really did something where all those people say anything I can do and there's really not much they can do. We had something that we can do and we damn well did it and we did it great and Don was very, very appreciative of it. So I want all you to know that this church did itself well. Uh, I was talking to somebody who couldn't be here. I was texting and uh, she, she made that observation. She said, I'm proud of our church and I gotta tell you, we are, you know, we're proud of it. Um, it took so many people, to, it, it took four people just to park cars. 
you know, we, we don't have much parking around here. And we ended up, this guy across the street here, who's in one of the nicest guys I've ever met, he came out and said, go ahead and park. And we, we had a row of cars parked across the street. So we had four people parking cars. We had three or four people trying to, to get it all arranged in here. And that's to say nothing about what happened over in the kitchen. There were a dozen, 15 people over there. But we all came together and we did it. So you can be proud of your church. Those of you who were here and those of who, you who weren't here, be very proud of this church. Be as proud of this church as I am. So I'll stop talking about that. Um, just the same announcements. We have um, the crafty ladies are still selling their, their um, mugs and their water bottles. Picnic is uh, August the 21st. And uh, Marie, is there a, a PW luncheon coming up? July 19th, Presbyterian Women Luncheon. Where is it? Villa La Rosa. So um, if you're interested in that, I'm sure you can contact Marie and uh, make a reservation. Any other announcements? Good. Please rise and join me in the responsive call to worship that you will find printed in your bulletin. <clears throat> For just this hour, follow me. Listen to my word, follow me. Come pray and sing. We have come to worship and praise God. Join with me in singing hymn number 466 from your blue hymnal, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Please be seated. Praise the Lord who forgives all of your sins. Please join with me in the prayer of confession you'll find printed in your bulletin. Ever present God, we want, we want to, to know, know and follow you, but there are so many voices that call us and we run after gods of our own choosing. Often we, we forget you. you. Forgive, Forgive us and help, help us to follow your lead. Amen. As the family of God, we belong to Jesus. Our moment of forgiveness belongs to Christ. God, through his Son, forgives us 
and frees us from the power of penalty and sin. Amen. Amen. Let's take a moment to uh, for silent prayer of confession. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading comes to us through the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 24, beginning at verse 14. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And now let me direct your attention to our New Testament reading. It's found in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 1, and also beginning at verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John and a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God, for the glory of God. Amen. Don was in the produce section looking at and wanting apples. And he was really surprised at all the varieties that were before him. For he saw Red Delicious and Wine Sap, Pink Lady, Gala, Fuji, and even Granny Smith apples. He just was amazed. He counted 12 different kinds of apples. Do you want to guess which one he chose? Not a one. Because <laughs> he couldn't decide. Well, I could relate to Don, at least at that point. On our first date, Karen and I wound up at Baskin and Robbins for ice cream. And there before me was this menu, 31 flavors one flavor for each day of the month. I, first, I really couldn't decide, what do I choose? Well, I didn't want to spoil our date, so finally I made my choice. I chose plain vanilla, soft vanilla in a cup. 31 flavors, and I chose plain vanilla in a cup. Well, Karen still talks about that even today. 
And after 43 years of marriage, my preferences have changed. And so is my waistline. I now prefer coconut ice cream, but I still like plain vanilla in a cup. In his book, The Paradox, the Paradox of Choice, Why More is Less, psychologist Barry Switzer or Schwartz says that sometimes offering few choices is better than offering too many. See, too many choices can lead to paralysis or indecision, while reducing choices can reduce anxiety. I think we as Americans love self-determination. In other words, the freedom to choose and to imagine there are more choices, the better. But there seems to be a point where, at times, too many choices may overwhelm us. I was thinking, thinking that what if there was one choice, one central choice that you and I could make that would make the other choices a little bit easier? Now, I'm not talking about the choices or decisions you and I make about what we were going to wear this morning, what we are about to eat, or even what we're going to drink. I'm thinking more about the heavier decisions. In other words, what leaders will you and I trust? What moral choices do we make? And where do we really find joy and meaning and satisfaction? Well, as we've just read in today's text from the beginning of Mark's gospel, we find that Jesus is at the start of his ministry. And notice that he hasn't yet revealed his mission. He hasn't decreed a command, healed a broken body, restored a sick soul, or even shared a parable. At this stage, he's a one-man movement. And he now starts looking for recruits, which is kind of strange because back in that day, if you were a student, you went looking for a rabbi or a teacher. But here we find, if you will, that order is in reverse. Later on in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Picture, if you will, in your mind, Jesus making his way around the banks of the Sea of Galilee. And he looks across that blue, clear, green lake, and he focuses on a small boat where there are two fishermen, two brothers, Simon and Andrew. And he watches them toss their net into the lake. And they wait for it to sink, and then they begin to tug it back, hoping that they'll snag at least a few fish. Again and again, they throw that net into the lake. And again and again, they haul it back, hoping for, well, at least a few, probably not a huge haul. Their backs are red from the sun, and their foreheads are dripping with sweat. And after watching for a while, Jesus, in a booming voice, says, Come, come and follow me, and I will teach you how to fish for men and women and not for fish. Well, not trying to be punny, but here's the catch. And that is you can't have a relationship with Jesus unless he calls you. Now, according to Mark's gospel, these fishermen, these first two fishermen immediately, and when you read through the gospel of Mark, that word immediately in the Greek is uthos, immediately or at once is one of Mark's favorite words. Immediately, Simon and Peter, or Simon and Andrew, were told they dropped their nets and they followed Jesus. Well, now Jesus has his first two recruits under his wings. And we find that he continues to walk along the shoreline and he spots two more brothers, James and John, brothers, the sons of Zebedee, along with it, well, some other men. And we're told they're mending their nets. 
So we're told without delay, he calls them. Calls them to follow him. And we're told the brothers, they drop their nets. They leave dad and the other guys, the hired guys in the boat, and they follow him. Well, here's another catch. And that is a call from Jesus can be disruptive. When you think about it, what prompted these two sets of brothers, these four fishermen, to follow Jesus right away so quickly? Had they already met him? Was there a compelling charisma about him? <laughs> Were they just tired of smelling fish? Were they looking for a new adventure? Well, let's get a little bit more personal and update it. In this year, 2022, why do you follow Jesus? Do you find him compelling? Does his teachings help, help you make sense out of life? Has he saved you from any kind of despair? Does he give you meaning and purpose? Is he the light of hope in your darkness? Have you ever questioned yourself about whether following Jesus is really the right thing to do? Perhaps you knew somebody who really was into, really follow Jesus, and now they no longer do. Are you making a mistake by being here this morning? By being part of the body of Christ? Taj Monk was a Danish pastor and playwright who protested against Hitler for not only killing Jews, but invading Denmark. And he was executed at the age of 45 as a martyr for his faith in Jesus Christ. Before he was murdered by the Gestapo, he wrote these words. Perhaps it's all a mistake, this business about Christianity. Sometimes it really looks like that to me. Perhaps all this talk about God and Jesus and the salvation of humanity is a collection of fairy tales. And I'm a minister. Perhaps that's a mistake too. Perhaps a mistake to preach love and forgiveness in a hate-torn world, to rescue those who are in need, to teach children, to comfort the lonely and dying. But if it's a mistake, then it's a beautiful mistake. If Christianity should turn out, after all, to be true, then unbelief will have been a very ugly mistake. See, friends, following Jesus helps us to clarify the direction of our lives. It helps us to deal with the most important decisions that come our way. Following Jesus forges our convictions and really shapes our core. Peter Marty, the publisher of Christian Magazine, Christian Century Magazine, writes, the kind of person we are at the center determines everything else about us. The choices, the commitments, the decisions we make stem from who we are from the inside out. If there's no center, life becomes a drifting enterprise with no sustaining purpose. See, that's why we don't commit to following Jesus only once. It's a commitment we make, well, every day, every hour, every moment. And I think mostly we do it in subtle ways or without thinking simply by being compassionate, forgive, forgiving, generous, respectful. And then there are other times when we follow Jesus when we're called to make an unpopular decision to make a significant sacrifice, or even to be able to stand courageously. And yes, sometimes we do it better, a better job of it than other days. Following Jesus gives us a purpose and takes us sometimes to surprising places. And we end up doing things we never dreamed of, we never imagined. And along the way, we gain confidence. 
many years ago as a chaplain's assistant. I taught Bible studies at the Luzerne Correctional County facility. And after being there a while, I was told I was with the men from M Block. When I asked, what does that mean? They told me, well, they were the worst of the worst. These were the guys that not only would you read about in the paper, but you would, in most cases, see them on TV. One time I was in the library setting the room up for the Bible study when a guard came in and said, don't come out of here until come, somebody gets you. Well, a few minutes later, I could hear the barking of dogs. And through the library window, passing before me were two huge German Shepherd guard dogs. Four members of SWAT in full battle gear, and in the middle was an inmate they were transporting from one section of the jail to another. Two days later, I saw Hugo on TV. Allegedly, he had killed two people and buried them in his backyard. Well, here now I was in the library wondering, is anybody going to come and get me? Well, finally, a guard did and said it was okay not only to come out, but go home. And I thought, go home, what about the Bible study? And he said, well, really, you only have 10 minutes left, and besides, the men on M Block, they're in lockdown, which meant no Bible study. And I wasn't particularly happy with that, but I thought, well, at least they were going to let me out. Well, as I drove up the mountain, I thought, how did I ever get myself into this? And then I thought, how do I ever get myself out of it? And then the Holy Spirit took that opportunity to tap me on the shoulder and remind me of the words when Jesus said, when you visited me in prison, what you did to the least of these, you did to me. Okay, Lord, I got it. You see, being with those men, those inmates in prison, built my confidence really in the Lord and set me on the right path of ministry. Following Jesus injects vitality in our lives because in him we can find well strength to endure the storms of our lives, to have peace at times of anxiety. Forgiveness when we have made really a mess out of things. Hope when the sun seems to go out. Guidance in times of confusion. Healing when there are times of pain. This past week, I was standing in line, the return line at Lowe's. And my eye caught a sign, and I couldn't keep my eye off it. Because the sign said, order your pain here. Huh? Order your pain. Now, obviously, part of it was blocked. It was really saying, order your paint here. But all I saw was, order your pain here. Well, remember that in our pain, through the scriptures, we have signs, we have realities of God healing. God also, through his son, Jesus Christ, what we find is, as Jack shared in terms of your ministry with the funeral of Wendy, you have a community of purpose. You have a caring community. And also in Jesus, you can find joy in times of sorrow. Army Chaplain Major Ivan Erikon was deployed at one point to New York City's hospital during the height of that city's COVID-19 pandemic. And when he showed up, he said doctors and nurses came running to him and they began weeping and crying and saying thank you over and over and over again. You see, they were working long hours and in those hours they were dealing with death many times over. They said, he said they would pull him aside and he would listen to their fears, their stress and their anxieties. And then he would patiently pray with them and for them. 
One day, a superior told him that a veteran had died from the virus and asked Ivan to preside over the memorial service. And Ivan recalled by saying, he says, soldiers pulled a man's body out of a refrigerated trailer, sort of like a makeshift morgue. The body was in a black bag. Soldiers stood at attention as I led the military escort to a nearby hearse. I said a prayer and nobody moved until the hearse drove away. As chaplain, I took an oath, an oath to respond to the needs of my nation, to care for the wounded, to nurture the living, and to honor the dead. I'm so grateful I was given the opportunity to serve. Friends, when you and I decide to follow Jesus, we sign on to serve. Serve to care for the wounded, to nurture the living, to honor the dead in such a way that we ignite a spirit within us, the spirit of Jesus, which brings us a deep, deep joy in our soul. In our text this morning, we find that Jesus called four ordinary, four common fishermen. Abraham Lincoln once said, God must love common people because he made so many of them. Four common, ordinary fishermen who were doing ordinary work on what seemed like an ordinary day. But through the presence, the power of the, of the Holy Spirit, they sensed a tug in their heart. And however frankly heard a whisper in their souls that he was the one, that Jesus was the one that could show them a way to an extraordinary life. Well, that same one that Jesus calls you and me. In this world, I think you already know, there are not only many voices, but there are many choices. Now, you may not choose soft vanilla ice cream in a cup, but I hope and pray that every day you choose Jesus, that you hear his voice, you answer his call, and decide to follow him. Amen. Let's stand and sing together in the blue book, Ye Servants of God.
be conceited. We offer our prayers now to a God who created us, who claims us, and calls us by name. Randy? Did you ever wonder what God's thinking when we pray? Uh, we know what we're thinking. We're lifting up our needs and our, our wants and our uh, uh, concerns to him. But what's God thinking? Uh, and it occurred to me a couple weeks back uh, that I found the answer in John. Uh, and when I say John, I don't mean John's gospel or John's epistles, but in John Prine. Um, he had a song, uh, Angel from Montgomery. Uh, and toward the end of that song, he says the following. Uh, How can a person go to work in the morning and come home in the evening and have nothing to say? I believe that God thinks as you walk through my creation, as you enjoy my provision, with all you see and experience each day, why don't we talk more? So as we come to prayer this morning, let's put aside our busyness and know this truth. Prayer is not a transaction or a process. It's a conversation and a relationship. God calls us to consider who he is and what he has done for us, to lift up our needs, to a father who waits and who listens, who cares, and who provides for his children. Who or, would it, who or what are we praying for this morning? Barb, what do you want? My neighbor asked for prayers for a friend of hers. She's only 39. Um, she had a brain aneurysm, she's got three kids, and she's supposedly, I think, taking care of either her mother or mother-in-law, um, so she asked prayers for healing. She said she should be okay if, if God forbid, they could prevent a stroke, so hopefully. Uh, her name is Heidi. Lord, we lift up Heidi uh, to you, to your concern. We ask for uh, that she would be comforted by your presence, uh, surrounded by folks, uh, family, friends, resources that you have provided to her uh, at this time of need and um, find herself, her rest and peace in you and her uh, guidance for the road ahead. We pray in Jesus' name. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Heidi. Uh, my father just recently had surgery and um, it's it, he's healing really well and I just uh, I praise the Lord for that I'm so grateful that uh, the outcome has been better than the family anticipated so praise Jesus and I just ask for continued prayers that uh, my father his name is Bob um, that he just continues to heal and um, that God just touch him with his healing hand we lift up uh, Heidi's father, Bob, uh, for continued recovery from um, the illness he was dealing with. We ask that God continue to be with him, uh, to surround him with his loving family, um, and to guide him through this time of need. We pray in Jesus' name. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. If there are no other intentions from our newsletter, uh, we seek God's healing presence for Janet Newell and for Eleanor Hathaway, for Fritz and Jean Wainwright, for Polly Grabelny and for Jean Miller, for Dave Hamill and Joseph Salcupa and Debbie Prince of Valley recovering from knee surgery, for Ginny Heal's cousin Isabel and for Faye Eckert, for Maritza Chambers' sister Elba, for Aiden Whitty, Steve Shore and for Fran Kraft, for Polly's son-in-law, Donald, and her daughter, Ava. For Nancy Wyatt and Marley. For Jane Cheslow, who is under the weather with COVID. And also for Dave Mudge, uh, a representative from the Presbytery, who was recovering from a heart procedure this past week. We ask God's comfort for Don Casper and his family. And we're reminded that that grief does not end yesterday. Let us continue as a church family to be with him and to continue to pray for him and his family. For Allison Keegan, uh, who's caring for her father, and for the people of Ukraine. We seek God's guidance and understanding for uh, Jim and uh, Franz Kraft's grandson, Avery. Uh, 
we continue to pray for God's traveling mercies for Annette and Malcolm Slaney as they continue to cross the country, and for Jim and Fran Kraft who are visiting Tennessee. We pray for Ashmore back here in worship with us. For uh, Amelia, uh, a new daughter for Ashley and Corey, and also to the Westfall family who yesterday uh, allowed us to use their yard for our overflow parking, uh, folks reaching out to help others in need. Uh, we continue to pray for the PNC as we continue to seek our mission of finding the good shepherd that this church uh, is destined to receive. But in the process, we are thankful and mindful, thankful for the good shepherds that we continue to have preaching in our pulpit and mindful that even as we wait, we are still the church. And as we were reminded in our scripture reading this morning, um, we stand, or uh, Joshua said, uh, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, uh, serve being an active uh, verb, uh, and serve is what the church is all about. So there are folks who are grieving, there are folks in need in the community and in our own church. Uh, they need us to be the church and let us certainly be the church for them. Let us bow in a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for another day to live for your glory by serving you. May we, by your Holy Spirit, be reminded of the words of the psalmist who said, Be of good courage, for he, the Lord, shall strengthen your heart. Lord, we are grateful that you share with us a fresh supply of strength that gives us courage to live fearlessly today. You replenish our diminished strength and intellectual creativity, emotional stability, and even our physical resilience. Father, the tension of these frightening days have made us all the more alert to your presence and power. The more we place our trust in you, the more the springs of tension within us are released and we unwind to find your peace within us. Thank you for your protection. And we renew our commitment to live by faith and not by fear. For your word tells us and you have proved that your perfect love casts out fear. Father, for grace and goodness, we offer our gratitude. Help us not to be dismayed and place our security in you. Fortified by your power, help us to focus on the needs of those who are being in the pews before us and around us, behind us. For those in the entire church family, for the community, May this be a truly great day and in the days ahead to serve you. Father, we thank you that because of you, our anxiety can be drained away. Once again, may we hear the words of the psalmist who said, As for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Father Abba, may we in our continued worship and as we leave this place, affirm that you are our God and that our times are in your hands. So Lord, once again, as a church family, as we bow our heads and hearts before the throne of grace, we offer to you the prayer that your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's not only in word, but in deed, that we offer our expressions of love to God through our giving. 
So I now invite our ushers to come forward to receive our gifts. Gracious God, we thank you that you are not only a loving God, but a giving one as well. We thank you for all your gifts, especially the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask now that you would receive and bless these gifts, that they would help us to grow deeper in our discipleship with you and each other, that we would continue to proclaim your good news, the good news of your kingdom, and share the salvation you offer through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we come, we worship, and we pray. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our concluding hymn, Take My Life.
into the Lord Jesus, the one and only Christ, calls you and me to leave our own ways and follow him and continue to be his disciples. So now sharing in the benediction, as you go into the world, and everything you do this week, and as you do, remember Jesus said, I am with you always. Amen. And God bless you.